On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene set out to go to the tomb in which Jesus had been laid. And as she went to the tomb and arrived there, she saw that the stone that was blocking the entrance to the tomb had been rolled away. And she was afraid. Immediately she ran to see the other disciples and she informed them, they have taken the Lord. They have taken the Lord and I do not know where they have taken him. And so, the other disciples, Simon, Peter, and the disciple whom Jesus loved, they came back with Mary to the tomb and they ran. And it turned out the disciple whom Jesus loved was a little faster than Simon Peter. And he arrived to the tomb first. And he peered inside and saw that the tomb was empty. And then Peter came and he walked inside. And he saw the linens that had been wrapped around Jesus' body and that the linens were here and the linens around his face that had been around his head in his death were on the other side. And then the other disciple peered in too. And he believed. But they did not fully understand just yet because they didn't quite get that Jesus had to have been raised from the dead. So they went, and they went, and they told the other disciples, but Mary, Mary remained weeping. And after a moment, she crouched down, and she peered into that tomb, and she saw two angels on the place where they had laid his body, one at the head and one at the feet, and, and they asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? She looked up through her tears, and she said, They have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And immediately then, Jesus appeared behind her, but she didn't know it was him. And he asks again, woman, why are you weeping? And she says, they have taken the Lord, and I don't know where he is. If you have him, can, can you tell me where he is, and I will bring him back to lay him down. And he responds, Mary. And through her tears, she looks up, and she knows, and she says, Rabuni, which in Hebrew means teacher. And Jesus looks at her, and he says, Do not cling to me. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Abba, but go. And tell my brothers, and say, I am here, and I have risen, and I will rise and go to my God, who is your God. I will arise, Jesus said. And through all of this, Mary looked and walked away, and she told everyone, I have seen the Lord. Amen? Will you please pray with me? Lord, we might have come today because we need to see you. We might have gathered up our strength to put on what we could, maybe our Sunday best, maybe what we have, but we bring it all properly clothed for your grace. And so let this time of reflection on your word bathe us with your spirit. May we arise from this experience blessed 
and ready for all that the world will bring us. In Jesus' name, amen. can't tell you how many times I have muttered to myself this mantra, this phrase, I will not cry, I will not let this get to me, I will not cry, I will not let this get to me, I will hold it together, I will hold it together. Have you ever done this? A lot of us have been raised to make sure that we can keep it together with lots of pressure for it, because we are in a culture that doesn't quite know what to do with our emotions. And so we hold them in, we subsume them, and we think that the strength and the most powerful way to respond to any old situation is to look like we could experience nothing but joy. Now the angels, as they appeared to Mary, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Woman, why are you weeping? And at first glance, it may seem as if they were saying to Mary that she had no right to weep. But look again. Look again. Now, Mary, as you can see in this story, was obviously overcome with emotion, and wouldn't you be too? I just try to imagine what that morning might have been like early, while it was still dark. I'm guessing she hadn't slept that night. And she started to gather her thoughts and she said, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the grave, I'm going to go to the tomb. I don't know what will be there, but this was a time that was not necessarily safe to go to the tomb. She did not know what would wait, await her, but what she did not by any measure, expect to see, was an empty tomb. Now, keep in mind that tombs are closed off in this time with stones that are not easy to roll away. It's not something that's easily done. And so I can imagine, as I often do, as I go and prepare myself to go see a grave, that I, start, I would visualize what I would see. I would think, all right, I will stare at that tombstone. I will stare at that big stone closing the door, and I will give thanks that I know where Jesus is. Because sometimes I might not have always known where he was as he wandered this land, but I did know if I could just picture that tombstone, then I will know where he is, and I'll know he's finally safe. So as she gets to the tomb and sees the door open, for any to come in and rob the space of her Lord. Imagine her discomfort, her grief, her sadness. Imagine her surprise because it was too much for her to make the leap to the good news just yet. And so she did what I would imagine any of us would want to do in such a time, and she ran, she ran fast, and it wasn't close, I don't think. She ran to tell these other disciples, and she saw Simon Peter, and she saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, whose name we don't know. And she said to them, they took our Lord. Now remember, again, in this time in which the state had executed him, and there were so many enemies of Jesus, there could be things that people would do with maligned interests with this body. So it was a political statement for her to affirm that someone had taken the Lord's body. And that was a fear that would be that all sorts of horrible things could happen and all that. You can just imagine, I feel like Mary was triggered. I know I would be. Peter and the disciple ran there and ran back and they came to the conclusions they needed. But they needed to look again. And that's what Mary did. And as she looked into that tomb and she saw the two angels awaiting her, they asked the pivotal question, woman, why are you weeping? Now, in this country, in this culture, in this environment in which it may very well seem like we shall not weep, we will not let this get to us. In a culture in which we talk a lot about triggered activity and behavior, 
And we actually sometimes malign it. I mean, think of all that we say about millennials and their trigger warnings in schools. You see so many articles about this. Oh, they're so sensitive. They get triggered so fast. They want a warning, as if we need to tell them something before they read a classic, right? I mean, imagine then how things might resonate in this space when we ask the question, why are you weeping? Why do you cry? But Mary wept and Mary cried. And as we look again to the story, what we have to recognize is that there are plenty of reasons to cry, okay? There's lots of reasons to be upset. There are, I mean, good Lord, who knows what's happening with North Korea? Who knows what's happening in Washington? Who knows what's happening in our world? There are plenty reasons to cry. People die out on these streets. There is crime. There is hatred. There seems to be growing anger that we don't know what to do with. There are plenty reasons to cry, church. And so as the angels ask the question, why are you weeping? It would be a misinterpretation of God's intent to think that she shouldn't have been. Because I want you to understand something. Through Mary's tears, she saw something profound. And I believe that they asked this question to trigger the right response, which she had. Why are you weeping, Mary? Because they have taken my Lord. That's an affirmation of faith that was not necessarily a given in this moment. Because remember, all those people who had shouted Hosanna last week at Palm Sunday, waving their palms, saying, hey, the Messiah is here, thank you, Lord, save us. They had those expectations of how Jesus would save. And when Jesus didn't do it in their way, when he didn't conquer the killing, when he went ahead to a cross and let them kill him, they thought, well, the Messiah would never let this happen. The Messiah would come in with trumpets blaring. The Messiah would come and take over everything. And so all these people who had expected all these things from Jesus were disappointed and they left him alone. So when Mary answered the question, why are you weeping? Because my Lord is not here. She said, my Lord, she held on. She held on to the truth of who he was. And even though she didn't have the explanation and she didn't understand, she affirmed who Jesus was in her life. And this is, my friends, instructive. It can be, I know I have this temptation too, that we want to skip through the agony of the cross, that we want to skip past Good Friday because it hurts too much, that we want to ignore the, the sadness, the reality that Jesus descended into death because that hurts. It might even make us weep. But do you understand what happened? It was only through her tears that she was able to see her Lord. Do you hear this, people? Do you see? It is through sometimes, through our crying, through our acknowledgement of the things that aren't right, through our pain, through all the anguish that we might feel, that we can see God and even closer relief than ever. Tears may very well be the lens that we need today to see God standing right in front of us. And so, when we're ready to look again, when we recall that, or when we notice that, that we want to see God, that we can't see God, we wonder where God is, why would this happen, how could I experience this God, why does my heart break? Recognize and know that in those moments, God is closest to us. And the mystics have long affirmed that when our hearts crack open, sometimes actually all the time, it's actually allowing the light to shine through even more. And with these broken hearts that we may have on this Easter morning, we get the chance to look again too. Because if you can't see God just yet, look again. And so, 
And so the good news is this. We had a song that we've been singing for this Holy Week. It says, have you died before? Have you died before? Has there been a time when you, when Jesus on the cross was you? There are times that come in our lives where we die, where we feel like death has taken over. Maybe it's the loss of someone we love so much. It could be death itself at our gates. It could be a time when we're taken into the hospital and wondering, will we make it back out? It could be a time when someone we love so much disappoints us. Or we look for the love that we thought we should have and we wonder if we'll ever find it. Our hearts break every day, or sometimes anyway, and as they do, if we could but let ourselves allow the light to come in, then God gives us a resurrection too. So, my question to you becomes, church, would you like to rise? Would you like to arise and welcome the God who loves you? Because you can arise and recognize that God will come to you no matter where you are, no matter how your heart feels, no matter what disappointments are lingering, God will still show up for you. God will show up at a table. God will set a feast for you. God is here. And God calls on us to step forward, to arise. So rise, church, if you're ready. If you're ready to affirm the goodness of our Lord. If you're ready for resurrection today, if you're ready for Easter to be more than just a story, but for it to be a proclamation of the one who lives, who lives in you, then rise. Rise and love the God who loves you so much, who would go to the ends of earth. Rise and know that God would even go to hell for you, and did. So therefore, there is nowhere you could go no experience you could have, no question you might face, no doubt you might encounter that God himself hasn't experienced. And that is the affirmation of Easter. Because God lives, because Christ lives, we live. And as C.S. Lewis put it, in Easter, the timeline of death gets rolled back. So live, church, because Jesus Christ lives, so do we. Amen.